Thank you. Good morning for being here. Great pleasure to be uh, invited to this meeting here uh, next to Porto. Uh, I'm going to try to take you through a method which might sound a little bit controversial, but I hope I can convince you that it's not really that controversial. Um, let's jump into the subject. My colleague, uh, Professor Gregory Schultz, would have liked to attend, but as he lives in Florida, they had Thanksgiving yesterday, and at this moment it's uh, 5.30 in the morning, so I didn't really want to get him out of bed. So I'll try to cover his uh, part as good as I can. I'm living in a small city called Amsterdam. So when you come at the airport, you see this. And when I saw that the first time, I said, that's the ideal place to have a company fighting uh, microbes. Um, first question, is there a common uh, pathology in, in chronic wounds? Um, if you look at diabetic foot ulcers, uh, arterial ulcer, pressure, pressure ulcers, or venous leg ulcers, um, we believe there is one, and um, the main factor in all those wounds is, um, the common factor is an infection, be it biofilm or um, planktonic uh, bacteria, but infections are mostly the case why wounds are not healing. There are plenty of other cases, but if you could eliminate the infection, would you be more successful in vascular surgery or in revascularizing re the tissue? I think yes. So uh, a study here done by, um, by Sugar, if you take biopsies of, uh, of chronic wounds, you find an 80% more uh, biofilm, and in acute wounds, you only find it in a couple of percent, four or five percent. <clears throat> Can you see a biofilm on a wound? Well, I think the answer is definitely no. A very small part of what is biofilm is usually on the, on the surface of the wound bed, and the other part is in the lower laying tissues. They're simply invisible. Sometimes people think they see biofilm, but they see slug. Uh, very quickly, um, if you look at the staph aureus and uh, you look at tissue penetration, you'll find those bacteria in the 20, 30, 40 micron range in tissue depth. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at, um, at, at, at the Pseudomonas, for example, you'll find them in the close to 100 micron range, so much deeper in the tissue. Very quickly on biofilms and bacteria, if you have the yellow part, which is, um, which is the wound bed, um, you might have a biofilm here, a biofilm there. Usually you get a cross uh, infection through the, the dressing. If you're not using anti-infective uh, dressings, it can be hidden in the slug. It can go deeper in the tissue. It can reach the capillary uh, system and then spread uh, to other parts of, uh, of the tissue. Oops. Oops. Step back. Step back. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what you very, very often see. That's your daily bread and butter, I imagine. So what you do is you do surgical debridement. That's the, I would say, most effective form if you want to get rid of your, inf or of your infection. It's a time-consuming thing. I'm not going any deeper in that because you probably perform that every day x times. It needs to be redone, so it's repetitive in a couple of cases. So you try to remove what is there uh, on the surface, which is usually uh, fibrin with dead material, necrotic cells, and so on. So why are biofilms very difficult to kill? Well, the answer for that is um, <coughs> it's an uh, extrapolymeric material. That's the content of a biofilm, which is also 97, 98% water molecules. It makes it very dense. Um, you have persisting bacteria with a very slow or low metabolic activity, so they're totally inactive uh, in relation to antibiotics. Oxygen diffusion, that can be also an important factor, so if the, if the bacteria are in the core of the biofilm, it's even more difficult to reach them. Um, 
synergism between bacteria, as we know. Um, things like, like MERSA this morning. I was uh, kindly invited by some of your colleagues at the, at the hospital in Porto. We had a patient which had um, a MERSA uh, infection. It was a very difficult one to treat. I cannot say too much about it because we did the treatment, or he did the treatment a week ago. Today we did a revision of that and we found quite nice tissue and no really uh, infective parameters, but it's too, 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 too short to draw any conclusion on that one. But I think we saved the leg. Very quickly, tolerance to, to antibiotics. As you know, um, the planktonic um, species are very um, susceptible to antibiotics, so you will kill them. On the contrary, if you have a biofilm, and in this case, you use tobramycin, well, you will virtually see no chances in that. Oops. Somehow the computer doesn't go along with me. Oops. Sorry for that. Oh. The step-down principle doesn't want to go on the screen. Okay, well, very quickly, the step-down principle I think you're all familiar with. Um, I'm doing nothing, guys. I swear. Is one after this one? I give it a try. Ah. Okay, on the right-hand side, that's normally what we do. So we use an aggressive method to really try to stop the, the infection as, as, as much as we can. Um, it's not a one-step thing very, very often. We try uh, to do DNA of bacteria to see what kind of, of, uh, of bugs you are really dealing with. You optimize your antibiotic, then slowly after a couple of days, you go to the orange part of it. You assess the inflammation. Um, you do the appropriate debridement steps over there. And you keep going after a month. Roughly, you get into the green part where you slowly start to see healing. Well, what we see with our method is that we go from the very right corner to the beginning of the green um, uh, columns over there. So we save a lot of time. It's usually a one-step method, so you only do it once. Okay, I spoiled this one. That's a slide from, uh, from David Armstrong. Time is tissue, and many other people are repeating that all the time. Um, the longer we wait, the bigger the wound bed is getting, or the deeper the wound is getting. So time is really a very big issue if you want to to heal a wound in a reasonable time frame. We all know that that's uh, theory and not praxis. Main reasons why wounds don't heal, well, um, we had the persisting infections. Can we control the infections? Yeah, well, time system is one of those very uh, well-established uh, things. I have a different definition to that. I think the time to perform care is really very important. It takes a lot of your time. Um, it's very intensive for the whole medical team, for the caregiver team. There's no, no secret behind that. You need to do a repetitive, uh, repeat your surgical debridement, which is also not only a costly, but a timely thing. And then um, if you then calculate the expense, the energy everybody is spending in this, including your patient, to try to heal that wound, it's an important uh, factor. A quick study on economies and on, on, um, on, on infections in, uh, in the UK from Professor Guess. We got two publications. One is a five-year uh, review on the situation in the UK. Uh, to my understanding, that was the only country where I found quite good and, and credible data. So if you look in a period of five years, so between 2012, 13, 17, and 18, we have an increase of wounds of 70%, more than 70%. The increase of the budget in the UK was close to 50%. 
If you then look to another paper from the same author, uh, published in 2017 um, on surgical debridement, in England they did 182,000 cases, which is the equivalent of roughly 450 um, million uh, euros. The development by my, my colleagues who stand behind this thing, I would like to present them briefly. That's uh, Dr. Alberto Cogo, he's in the north of Italy. Um, he allowed us to work clinically in a very, very early stage. Uh, today, he has been treating over 3,000 patients, so it's quite a big number of patients. Um, my second partner doesn't want to, to come up. Yes, there he is. Professor Carlo Bignozzi, a chemist, who helped us to, to formulate what the product is today. Greg Schultz from the University of Florida, myself, and our newest lab um, assistant, Wufi, very, very uh, talented. Uh, that should be a quick video, a live case, so I'll try to let it work. So you have controlled your, your pain in, in, in your patient. You have to see that this method is very similar to surgical debridement. So if you use a scalpel, you do the same thing. So what we do here is we rub, we rub the wound bed with, with gauze. We try to remove whatever has to be removed. We then dry the wound bed. I could speed it up a little bit, but I'm not going to risk that. The three gentlemen are looking very angry at me if I try to do that, so. But this is a live case, so it shows you how long it takes. Um, compare this to surgical debridement. So your pain treatment is virtually the same thing. We're just comforting the leg of the patient here. Um, for your information, it's a vascular ulcer, and this patient really, really had a lot of pain. So the moment we started to remove the bandage, he really, really had pain. So here we did a nerve block with the help of an anesthetist. That's the product. It's a red uh, gel. It has a certain viscosity. We wrap it on the wound bed, but also on the healthy tissue surrounding the wound bed. We Pay a lot of attention to the peri wound area. And we wait 60 seconds. You can have a chat with your colleagues in the meantime. But if you compare this to surgical debridement, it's already pretty, pretty quick. Uh, what we saw in COVID times is that we did quite some cases in home care or in a doctor's office, but not in a hospital because we couldn't risk taking our patients into, into hospitals during a certain time in the north of Italy that was virtually impossible. What he's now doing, he's washing off the, the product uh, you might ask yourself what the product is. Well, it's a very powerful acid. It's called methanosulfonic acid. But you all understand that if you would put any type of a stronger acid on living tissue, it'll burn straight through it. It's not the case here. And what Alberto is doing here, he is really rubbing uh, the wound bed, so he tries to remove whatever is coming off. You see also something, um, if you pay attention, that the wound bed is turning black. That's not necrosis, that's what we call carbonization. So whatever was on there, uh, in terms of fibrin, slow, whatever, turns very quickly black. We leave it on, it will fall off in a week, 10 days, 
and if it doesn't come off because it might be a thick crust, you take a curette and you, you remove it. I wouldn't rub that much, but I'm not as routine as Alberto. So here you're done. You can do um, whatever you like to do. What we do very often is uh, negative pressure. So immediately afterwards, in certain countries, uh, and not in this case, we, we do grafts quite fast afterwards. It's a desiccation process, but strangely enough, the wound bed will not remain dry. It will regain its normal uh, level of humidity, and um, off you go. A very quick view. We have published a couple of articles. Unfortunately, during COVID, I think everybody had the same idea. Let's publish something, finally. So everybody has been submitting tons of articles to all kinds of journals, to all the medical disciplines. So there is a bit of a queue and a bottleneck. So we try to get a couple of articles out. I think the next one is coming out in the journal of, of the UMA. Uh, we will have a couple of presentations at the UMA and at the World Congress. Quickly, 136 patients, nothing surprising. Elderly people, a little bit more men than women. We don't have all the luck as men. Those are the cases we, we did in this series. So 67 are diabetic uh, foot ulcers, uh, 33 venous leg ulcers, a couple of ischemics, if you look to our eye view, ischemia, ischemia is a contraindication. But as a couple of, well, pretty many uh, of the vascular surgeons try to do whatever is possible to save uh, a limb. So you might sometimes, and I'm doing it with intention, I still try to get those legs um, in a way infection free and allow revascularization. It's not very successful because ischemia is, is like the end of the road, but sometimes, uh, for example, the University in Hamburg a did a couple of cases which were presented at the virtual UMA a couple of weeks ago in March, and they were very su successful in that. But that's a difficult thing. We had a, a trauma case in there with a, a virological case in there. It was a case of a herpes simplex. Patient came to the clinic, so we simply treated him. We didn't cure herpes but we took the symptoms away and the pain away, and, and that's the, whole, the bottom line. So what were those patients um, for the diabetics? We had Wagner 2 and 3, and for the pressure ulcers, we had grade 3 and 4. Uh, the lesion time before we did the treatment, so the majority was above, well above six months, somewhere in the couple of years. Suspense. Okay, there we go. In less than 30 days, we, we reached the end point of our exercise, which is 100% granulation. <clears throat> and another couple of weeks, like two months, we had a total of 90%. So those wounds have never been responding to any other treatment. They have been in a, let's say, a stable state or even um, getting a little bit worse over time. So uh, if, if you consider that, it's quite a remarkable thing. You see a couple of blue little boxes. Well, those were patients with 99% uh, vascular issues, but we tried it anyway. So vascularization is a big thing, um, as we all know, but at least uh, we got some success over there as well. In most of the cases, we used it a single time. In some cases, we repeated it. Uh, as I said, uh, this morning, we had a very difficult case here in Porto. A patient with sepsis, the sepsis was treated, the, pro the, the, the leg was treated. We had osteomyelitis, so again, an another contraindication. But before uh, we go to amputation, we gave it a try. The wound was stable this morning, and there was maybe not really an infection anymore, but we just wanted to repeat it a second time to be very sure. And uh, let's cross our fingers and hope that this um, goes the right way. The follow-up we do is, is standard what you do, uh, two, three days, depending on the level of, uh, of exudate you're seeing. The end point is 100% granulation. Um, yeah. Side effects, important one. 
we didn't see in any of our 3,000 plus patients classic side effects. What we see and what's uh, a thing to, to consider is that you have a burning sensation. The moment you wash the product away, you dilute it in effect, so it becomes more fluid and it goes into little cracks of the wound bed or the, the, the wound border area and that gives a bit of a, of a burning sensation. Um, what we see with patients with chronic pain, on the contrary, is that the pain totally disappears. It's part of a randomized clinical study which is running. And just to give you an idea, we start three other randomized series, each with four hospitals across, uh, let's say, major part of the European countries, to also study that effect. How do we control the pain? Well, in, in our clinic, and, and usually what I'm using is, um, if your sensitivity is, is an AMLAC cream, 10%. Uh, and in worst cases, where it's really not avoidable, we, we do, a, of course, a nerve block. That's probably what you're more interested in, to see some cases. So that's a typical... Uh, typical daily patient. So a couple of little wounds uh, around the, the leg. We clean the wound bed, that's the far uh, right picture. We apply the product um, on the wound bed but also on the healthy tissue after washing it and drying it. You see a nice border between um, wound bed and healthy tissue. After a week we saw a nice granulation. Another week the same, let's say, wound here. We see it even nicely progressing, so that that wound is out of the, let's say, the gray zone. Here we are the onco-hematological patient uh, with a very necrotic um, foot here. Uh, we were able to get granulation back in roughly two weeks, less than two weeks. Important, we never use antibiotics. So we don't combine anything with our, with our uh, treatment. What we also do for study purpose, we use the most simple dressing you can do afterwards. That's not what you should do, but that's what we did because we didn't want to falsify our outcome with, let's say, other smart dressings. And there are plenty out there from our uh, colleagues of the industry. Uh, and you should use them. So if you want to use VAC, use VAC, fantastic. It will even go much quicker. And if you have um, anti-infective dressings or whatever you like to use, please, please use them. But we didn't want to falsify our data, so that's the reason we couldn't do it. Today we're using whatever we have at hand and whatever is best indicated. So I'm just going quickly through those. That's the case um, because it's done in Portugal, in, Lis in Lisbon. Uh, it was, uh, I think, somewhere in summertime, if I remember right. It was a 50-year-old patient, um, venous insufficiency and a chronic wound for at least five years. So a bit of a desperate case. Uh, the professor over there, I wasn't there, um, agreed to treat it with my colleagues uh, from Overpharma. Um, a couple of days later, oh, that's the first application, so MLA 5%, that's what they had at hand. Then it worked nicely. They, they just uh, put it on the wound bed. You'll see it going through here a couple of days later. You see some granulation on the left-hand picture. Um, six days post, 18 days, 24 days. Quite unbelievable. And in two months, we were able to reverse the situation in this patient. So we got, I would say, 95% complete epithelization um, of a patient who had a chronic wound for um, more than five years. Okay, the pictures are not so good. They're very good in treating wound. They're less good in taking pictures. I'm trying to get to some more drastic pictures. Those are part of a publication. Yes. That's, a, I would say, almost at the end of the, the scope where we, we normally go. 
It was a very particular patient uh, with two massive wounds, venous insufficiency. It was an elderly lady. She wasn't apt for um, uh, anesthesia. It would have probably be lethal to her. So uh, the nurse who was treating her was really fighting for this lady and nobody really wanted to touch that because you have bone exposure, you have osteomyelitis, you have a naughty uh, wound up there. And the vascular system was, um, to put it mildly, a disaster. But we got a team of vascular surgeons. We got a plastic surgeon. We got an orthopedic surgeon willing to, to give it a shot. Um, and this is absolutely not a classic case. Oops. There comes the computer. So after almost a month, we got quite a nice recovery of uh, granulating tissue. And we got spontaneous healing in this patient, which sounds a bit impossible, but it, it did that way. Today, that lady is still walking around and she's considering all the difficulties she's in. She's in a pretty good, uh, pretty good shape. <clears throat> It doesn't matter which type of non-healing wounds you're addressing. Uh, if there is infection, this is probably what's going to help you. And it's worth to give it a try. Um, I'm showing maybe some nice pictures and you're all thinking, um, yeah, too good to be true. Well, what I've been doing the last three years is traveling the globe, despite COVID, and just give the opportunity wherever it was possible. So we got our product registered uh, early this year. So in the pre-registration phase in some countries, some hospital, we got the, the, the approval of the hospital but, and of the patient to do it. And we simply try to use it or have, the, have people using it on their own patients because they know what they did, they know how they treated them, and that's probably the only data which will convince you, which is totally understandable. That's a case, again, out of the normal scope, it's the University of Amsterdam, the trauma center, orthopedic clinic. A young fellow had an accident, probably with a bike. Uh, he got plates, he had a fibula fracture, um, didn't listen to his doctor. So he kept walking and doing silly things. After uh, remission from the hospital, he got a massive infection. He came back on the weekend, on a Friday. That's what patients like to do. And the team there did nothing else than um, trying to open the wound, clean the wound, heavy antibiotics, uh, take the plate out, as you will see in a sec. Then they gave me a call. So that's the, the fibula fracture. A lot of tissue was lost. Um, this is straight after the treatment. So here you see very nicely the, the black uh, coloring of the tissue. It, it really looks like, like uh, carbon, like charcoal. So um, that's how it looks. That's the other wound at the ankle. Uh, Professor Kloon, that's the guy who runs the department there, Peter Kloon. He did uh, two vax on that uh, leg for five days. Then we looked at it again after five days. Maybe not so good visible, but the infection signs of the surrounding tissue were virtually gone. Uh, we didn't really trust this fully, so we kept going on with VAC therapy for another five days. Then the plastic surgeons did their, their job in what they're good, so they had a reconstruction for six, seven hours. Um, so far, the patient is, is out of the hospital. He's doing fine. Um, so maybe for a summary or discussion, whatever you, you would like to call this, we know that most non-healing wounds are definitively infected. Time is tissue, so the longer you wait, the bigger your wound, the deeper your wound, the bigger the problem becomes. Um, can we stop the inflammation process with a single treatment? Well, in 80-90% of the cases, you definitively can. Um, the product is independent of, of the wounds you try to, uh, to, to cure with it or to, to treat with it. A couple of questions I very often get is, oh, but you're desiccating the wound bed. 
you're drying the wound bed. Yes, that's true, but it's only for a very short period. What you will have is you will get an os an, um, a, a, a very strong osmosis effect, so water from the lower tissues will be brought to the surface. That's how your body reacts if there is an infection or if there's a situation like desiccation. So that's something we see very quickly. Um, Sorry. Ah, there we go. Exudate. Another thing, heavy exudating wounds, once uh, you perform the treatment, you will have much, um, very little exudate, which is also logic. If there is no infection in the tissue, again, your body will just say, well, stop exudating. There is no need for that. So that's also one of the, let's say, parameters you, can, you will see. The microbiome, very important thing in wound healing, as we have all heard and, and learned many times. Well, if you take the pathogens out of it, your microbiome will also recover qu quite quick. It's something we, we observed and which is currently under publication. So, uh, uh, we use it as the title of the first publication, which came out end of last year. What we do is we reverse the wound bed, so we try to reverse it from a chronic to an acute wound bed. That's where we stop with our methods, and that's where all the other methods available on the market come into action. Maybe you want to hear a few words how this thing is working. Um, if we have a picture of a biofilm and, and microbes, that's roughly how it looks. So you have a lot of water, a lot of water molecules. I couldn't do that any better, so please excuse me for that. So you have those water molecules dancing around. So we use uh, methanol sulfonic acid, and what we do is it triggers a proton desiccation. So what the acid is doing, it's looking for water. So the first source of water is what you have left on your wound bed. So if you have some biofilm there, that's fine. But then it will go immediately and, and look for the next reservoir of water, which is then in the biofilm in the lower tissue. The force we create is pretty high, it's around 1400, 1500 joule. So again, the water is really moved to the surface and um, acts with the acid. If you look to different type of bacteria, I talk, took, took this out of a, a, a publication from uh, Randy um, uh, Walcott. <coughs> in Texas, so he tested and he made a nice slide of that. So all the types of bugs you can find in all the type of wounds, so we definitely tested all those. We included multi-resistant uh, bacteria. That's a study from uh, Matt Malone in Australia, an in vitro study, so what did he do? He uh, used MBEC, um, a semi-solid uh, model, and a CDC bioreactor, those are three models which people like to see. On top of that, we did human tissue, that's currently running, and a porcine uh, skin models. We do that in, with the University of uh, Hamburg, Eppendorf. If you look, oops, I was too quick, but it doesn't matter. The lock reduction, a couple of, of seconds, you cannot detect anything anymore. And microscopic, you see a little bit wider this, so this is how it is. A couple of seconds later, you have absolutely nothing anymore. Um, that's a tricky one, it's a video. It's done by the Danish Institute of Technology. They try to help us in visualizing what we normally would like to see. Unfortunately, the reaction is so brutal and so fast that you cannot capture it even on, 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 on high-tech filming equipment. Okay, and the video doesn't want for some reason. Do you think you could start it? Hey. Okay, so we used two bacteria to, to do this, uh, to, to mimic this. So we were looking for uh, bacteria who are quite active in their movements. So we took Salmonella and Coli. And you will see um, from the top side here, you will see a, a shadow coming, that's the needle. 
So the magnification scale is quite big. And you will see a wave going down that way. You see? And you see no movement whatsoever anymore beside the liquid who is gently moving. The coli bacteria are a little bit more lazy than salmonella. They move a little bit less, but you will see absolutely the same thing. We try to, to study this or to film this a little bit better. I have no clue how they do that, but they use some very specific cameras. It's just a couple of slides, so it's not really visible. The moment you, you bring bacteria in contact, bang. What does it do with bacteria? Well, it breaks open the core of bacteria. It works with yeast. It would also, and it works also with viruses, but we have no viruses uh, to deal with in, in wound care. So the moment you see something black, that's again the needle. So, as a, let's say, a little team of a couple of scientists working together, we created a little company around it in 2019. Um, I was persuaded to develop a product out of it. Uh, not really willing too much to do that because I know the amount of work would come um, onto it. Um, well, we did it. We got onto the market. We got our approvals. We are now approved in most of the countries around the globe, uh, starting in Latin America, some Asian countries. We are working um, in, in the Middle East, very close of, of getting the approval. And beginning of the year, we start in the US. We cannot be everywhere at the same time. Um, we got a couple of publica uh, pub publications out there. We got quite a couple of talks. We had one here to launch it in 2020, but we had a small issue with the pandemic. So it has been postponed until next year. Um, next spring in February, we will be at the Yuma. And I think there are around five or six presentations from scientists, clinicians all over the, the place who will present their data. I don't even know who will present. Uh, they do it totally independent of us. There will be an economic study by Professor Guest. That's one thing. And maybe to close this, um, because I discovered that uh, this morning on the, on the wall of, uh, of the hospital in, uh, in Porto, it's maybe not that drastic and that dramatic, but sometimes amputation seems to be a little bit closer at hand. So I'm very happy that we have found something which can probably stop that in a couple of cases. And um, yeah, every leg we don't amputate and we can heal. That's, I think, why we're here for. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. No, no, absolutely not. If you would leave it on healthy tissue, the reason why the, the healthy tissue is not uh, getting damaged by the product, if you respect the timings, if you would leave it on and you go for a walk, of course you get desiccation. So you will, the, the product will look for, for, for water, for humidity, uh, in the epidermis and then it will go to the dermis so you will get a blister without feeling the pain of a burn but the effect will be pretty much the same but if you stay in a safety zone from five minutes we tested it on ourselves. that's how you work in the lab so uh, my colleague Carlo Bignozzi he has a couple of scars but those were the early versions of the product so it's absolutely safe we, we had a 30 second approach but regulatory was a bit concerned about 30 seconds, so we triggered the molecule on 60 seconds. Here we are. Yes, please. Yes. In 90% of the cases, 
it's can I ask again the question because yeah. some people are online and they don't answer okay. the, they don't hear the, the question so again just come back thank you very much for your presentation I need to ask you within your experience you just use it once or when you plan to reapply do you need to reapply with all the cases and or your experience using the product well you try to disturb the wound bed as less as you can. It's a very radical method, as I said. So in 90% of our cases, we do it just once. Uh, in the case we did this morning, I applied it a second time, not because I necessarily needed to do it, but it was a very deep wound. It was, it was uh, on the healing, it was four and a half centimeter, five centimeter deep. We had to deal with osteomyelitis in there. Uh, that's what we had on the, on the MRIs. So we just wanted to be very, very sure, and that patient was at the verge of, of amputation. So nothing can go wrong, let's do it a second time. What happens if you do it, if you would do it every two days, there is absolutely no necessary, there you're going to disturb your, your wound bed, your natural healing. So all this thing does is it reverses the, the, the chronic wound bed to an acute wound bed, and then you should let uh, nature with a little bit of help um, do its work. If you really see signs of infection, um, of course, you can repeat it. In the complex case where we saw the, the toes, that case we used it seven times because we were very, let's say, unsure and we didn't want the, um, the infection to, to, to reappear. So we, you know, when you start with something, you sometimes are a little bit over um, excited to do it. Uh, apply it really profoundly on the wound. A little vial is roughly covering 100 square centimeter, but that's the theory. If your wound is deep, you have a different story, and you don't know how, let's say, the, the, the tunnels and the channels in, in that wound bed can be, so you just do it really royally, as, as I say, and you wash it out and you're fine. So very big majority is a one-time proce process. Thank you. I'm just asking because I used the product and I saw a very good evolution. But um, meanwhile, you know, I'm, it's passing more or less 15 days to 20 to 30 days. And I was just was asking because I don't see any sign of infection. But it's a really complicated patient, deep wound. That's why I'm asking because I'm also learning with you guys. So yeah. just to try to understand what's happening. I mean, Thank you very much. If you, if you start using the product and, and you're not really sure, you can always contact us, but that's going to be me and, and my colleagues. In the meantime, we got quite a big um, group of, of supporters who can help us, people who simply work with the product and, and have a bit more experience now. For us, it was all very difficult because we started on ourselves, and then you have to convince the next one in line, be it uh, Marco Romanelli or Alberto Piacesi or... Um, uh, uh, José Luis Lazaro, those people are pretty tough cookies because they know what they do. They're not amateurs, so they try it very carefully like everybody. Uh, go for difficult cases because that's what you're going to believe and what, what is going to bring them the, the most benefit. So the patient, without having seen it and knowing anything about it, that's really a good thing. Something we see in certain wounds is, um, because I got the question a couple of days ago from somebody, uh, the wound had a certain size, and after treatment, a couple of days later, when they changed the, the, the bandage, the wound has grown by 50%. Oh, well, the peri-wound area, something you don't really see what's, what's inside because you, you don't simply don't see it. So if that tissue is infected, it will, of course, come off because it's in a way dead tissue, but you might not see it at the moment of treatment. What you then see is that the wound will start to reduce, the wound bed is reducing very quickly because there's nothing in the way and it, it has not normal or natural healing and it goes in pretty quick. So that's the other surprise. Um, what you also see is that you see something which especially vascular teams do not like to see it gets black, so they think very quickly, oh, necrosis. In Germany, we had that at the, at the university with uh, Professor Sturmer and her team. But very quickly, she understood, and, and it's logic that this is quite normal. It's carbon, it's not necrotic tissue. And even in very, very difficult cases, you then see that the patient comes the right way. 
Thank you. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, that was one of my questions, if you can apply the product uh, in uh, cavities, in wounds. And uh, if you have any study, any study comparing the effect of Debricam uh, in different type of cells. We did our histological homework, and that's, that's something which is also on the, on the, on the publication now. Um, we see not really a big disturbance of the natural tissue, that's, that's the good thing. So, of course, again, as I said, it's not a soft method. It's not a kind of cream which you have to apply a couple of times. It's a, it's a brutal thing. It's like if you use a scalpel, that's not a soft thing, but it's the only thing which will get you where you want to go. What we see in, in the praxis in the clinic in, um, in Vicenza, in Italy, with, with Alberto, we started probably four years ago with the prototype of the prototype of the product, with the approval of the hospital and the patient. So we did the really naughty cases, the big wounds, the difficult ones, and slowly the product has been used over, as I said, a couple of thousand times. So what happened there, it's a small little city. The, the population you have, your wound population, well, they get treated, they get healed. Not every wound is successful, unfortunately. We cannot help you there either. Uh, that's too much of a magic. But what we see over time is that the size of the wounds are reducing for a very simple reason. We don't wait that long anymore. So if Alberto sees a wound and after 10 days he doesn't see any signs of healing, well, he says, I try it, at least there is no infection. And we figure out the other problems, why the wound is not healing, in a second step. So he takes that out. We still see big wounds, but they are then referred from other hospitals and, and other patients who slowly start to hear about the method. So um, it's a learning curve. We are the very beginning of it. Um, but I think it shows very promising. It needs a lot of clinical work. That's why um, I mean, we still are a very small company. We are like 20 people. That's not really big. Um, compared to some of our bigger friends uh, downstairs. But we are launching 14 studies next year, and three of them are randomized multicentric studies. So that's each with four hospitals. So our clinical department is making uh, extra hours, I think. So we hope to publish and to present and to, to share that with, with everybody. As soon as we get data, we will have a lot at, at Yuma. Um, we will have a lot, I think, at the World Conference, which is unfortunately four weeks later. Uh, but some people go to one and not to the other, so that's fine. And uh, plenty of national meetings going on. We were supposed to talk with Greg Schultz at the meeting in Germany next week. It has been cancelled. So instead of that, I'm going to the UK, if I can, <laughs> work in St. Thomas. So it's a bit of a, of a difficult thing for, for everybody to get out, to, to do things, um, to be able to, to see patients and, and to treat. So if you have a patient, you would like to do it. You're in Portugal, contact my colleagues. If you have material, simple pictures, brief description, that's the patient, that's what we did, that's what we tried to do. Uh, we can definitely help you. It doesn't matter if it takes some time from us to... To get onto that, we have a nice team of people, very capable to help me. And um, off we go. See for yourself. Thank you. Okay, well then I thank you for your attention and your time, and um, have a very nice meeting. Thank you.